grandchildren Megan Newton, Amber Vickers, Catherine Vickers, and a great grandchild Blair Newton. Daughter Wendy Jowers and husband Jim. Grandchildren Madison and Colin Jowers. Daughter Carrie Paul and a husband Alan. Grandchildren Chloe and Ellie Paul. The daughter Holly Jordan and her husband Shane and the grandchildren Andrew and Kate Jordan. Amy and Brian Vining, grandchildren Gant and Gabe Vining. A son, Jay and his wife Ashley. Grandchildren, David Allen Vickers and Julie Vickers. Two sisters, Debbie and Jerry Sutton and Kathy Vickers. Sister-in-law, Patsy Moore. Mr. Vickers is also survived by a host of extended family and friends. He was preceded in death by his parents, Jay Vickers and Ruth Russ Vickers, wife of 13 years, Patricia Vickers, mother-in-law, Jean Percy, and brother-in-law, Keith Moore. Today, the active pallbearers are sons, Jason and Jay Allen Vickers, grandsons, Gant and Gabe Viney, Colin Jowers, Andrew Jordan, and David Allen Vickers. Honorary Paul Bears today are the former and current employees of General Telephone, All Tail, and Windstream. Today we're here to celebrate and to remember the life of Brother Vickers. And as we begin to reflect on that over the past couple of days, one thing that stands out to me above all is a man of character, integrity, and dignity. He was steadfast in his devotion, not only to, of course, his Lord and Savior, but to his family. If you hung around Brother Allen very long, you knew that he loved his family. And when you sing one, you sing all. Uh, you just didn't have a gathering of one or two here and there. I would often go over thinking, you know, it's just going to be Sister Judy and Brother Allen. And oftentimes it would be the whole gang. And they're a very, very large family, a loving family. And family today, man, what a, what a legacy he has left. Look around today. You're loved. You're cherished. And that in itself is a testimony of who Brother Allen was. Last Sunday, he was there at the church. He was getting ready for Sunday morning worship. And I had the opportunity to go sit down with him and speak for just a few moments, as I often did before our worship began. And I seen him this past Sunday, and I was like, hey, how are you doing, Brother Allen? So good to see you. I've been praying for you. And immediately he began to shift focus to his family. He said, you know, Brother Heath, he said, I'm a blessed man. He said, my family has taken great care of me. He said, and my precious wife, Judy, treats me like a king. And on the very next breath, he said, and not only has she treated me like a king, but she's my queen. And today, when I think about that and reflect on that, I just think about the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Psalms 46, verses 1 through 3, it says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through earth and what happens here on earth, through the mountains and in trials and tribulations. We will not fear. So today, we have a blessed hope entrusted in the right place who is Jesus Christ, the same hope that Brother Allen had. But you know what? We're going to go through things. We're going to face things. Brother Allen faced a lot of things in his life, but through it all, he had hope in who his Lord and Savior is. And through it all, he had hope in his family. He, he, he loved his family. He supported his family. Today, I just want to celebrate Brother Allen. And I'm, I'm so thankful to have been a part of his life. And I could share several stories with you this morning, but... One of the main stories that sticks out to me when it was just me and him was Christmas lights. One day we were putting up several Christmas lights and Brother Allen had made his way over there and, and he got out of the truck and uh, proceeded to help us put up uh, Christmas lights and he kept looking at his watch and I was like, or looking to see what time it was and I was like, you're all right, Brother Allen? He was like, yeah, he said, just, he said at 2.30, I've got to be here. At 3.30, I've got to be there. At 4.30, I've got to be there. And at this such a time, I've got to be there. And I just kind of smiled and I said, Sister Judy's got you on the schedule. This <laughs> and he just smiled like he always did, that gentle, calm smile. And he said, yeah. But through it all, you know, he loved his family. He didn't mind Sister Judy. 
oftentimes I remember all the all the things we were involved in. He was there to support you, support the family, and every time we you'd have a conversation with him, it was two two main subjects: his family and the good Lord. And I'm so thankful for that, and I know family today. You're thankful for that. And today, you know, it's often been said that it's not goodbye, but it's rather see you later. Because one day there'll be a great reunion day, and I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. Amen? Amen. So today, take comfort in the fact of who Brother Allen was, the legacy that he leaves here today. His grandsons, his, his children, his family, his friends. We were blessed to have known Brother Allen Vickers. My life was impacted through Brother Allen, and not just Brother Allen, but this wonderful family here. And today, I just want to say we love you, we appreciate you, and not just today. But in days to come, we're going to be here to pray for you and to just support you in any and every way possible. Let's pray. Father, today we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we had to share the life of Brother Allen. God, we thank you today, Father, for what he is, Father, and what he meant, Father, to so many, many people. And Father, today we thank you for that hope and that peace and that comfort, Lord, today that comes from you. And Lord, today we thank you for that peace like a blanket from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. And God, today I thank you for being with this family, leading, guiding, and directing them. And Father, today I thank you for the man of integrity and dignity and character. Father, I thank you for the example that he set for us all of loving you with every ounce, every fiber of his being and loving his family and loving his precious queen wife. And Father, today go with us now for the remainder of our time here together. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. I dream of a city called Glory, so bright and so
we're here today to celebrate Brother Allen's life. And what a great life and legacy that he has lived. But you know the difference in today is also we're here to celebrate Jesus Christ. Because he is truly the difference maker in what happened in Brother Allen's life. And the difference maker in times like this. And so it's truly my honor today to be able to share with you some things about his life and also his Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I look back over and hear all the stories of over 43 years of marriage, of raising six children, 13 grandchildren, and a, a great grandchild, it has been amazing to me to see just how much family and Jesus has affected his life. I want to tell you about a story that really happened over 43 years ago that had a great effect on the life and the legacy of this family. It's the story of before Miss Judy and Mr. Allen had got married and they were in the courting period or as young people would say dating today. And during that period, uh, Miss Judy undoubtedly had bought a cow trough. You might say, why did she have a cow trough at her house? That was the swimming pool. It was the swimming pool that her, her family swam in. And many times that cow trough would get full and it would have to be. There wasn't a, a modern filtration system that dumped it out. So it required some brawn to take the cow trough and turn it over so that there could be fresh water put in the swimming pool. Makes me think of the Beverly Hillbillies a little bit about it. <laughs> so anyway, while Miss Judy was dating, she was actually uh, dating somebody else. And during that time, the man or the, was not able to have enough strength to turn the cow trough over and uh, dump the water out. But along came Mr. Allen. <laughs> and I'm not sure that was the test. <laughs> But somewhere along the line, he flexed his muscles and the cow trough was full and he dumped the water out of the trough, cow trough and guess what? 43 layers. And now is the rest of the story. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how God can order our steps through things that we just don't know? But I believe with all my heart that God ordered the steps. The Bible tells us that he will order the steps of a righteous man. And I believe over that period of time that he has ordered the steps of this family. He also ordered it to a time where he took his family to an Argyle Church of God. And you know, I thought about how that really changed your whole family. During that time they were uh, introduced to the work of the Holy Spirit and how it changed all of their life. And now we can look back 43 years later and we can see the effect of how God truly has the best for our life. And I looked at a scripture that really speaks to me about how Jesus comes into our life and to understand that Jesus was fully human, but he was also fully God. The Gospel of John chapter 11 to me makes it more clear probably as much as any part of the Gospels where we see the human nature of Jesus Christ, but we also see the divine nature of Jesus Christ. It was in John chapter 11 where one of his friends and family members was sick and he was dying. The Bible says in the Gospel of John chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, it says, So his sister sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, the one who you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not meant for death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. Later on, he says, Then he said after this, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going so that I may awaken him from that sleep. It's in this moment where we see the, the human side of Jesus. How that he understood how important family was. As probably much of any family in the New Testament, we see the relationship between Jesus, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. How they had this close connection and this family. And we also see how much the human side of Jesus, how the Bible tells us that he loved Lazarus. And not only did he love him, but he acknowledged that he was his friend. What I love about this story is in the human side of Jesus that we understand that Jesus loved Mr. Allen. And not only did he love Mr. Allen, but he considered him his friend. What greater thing 
can we get from our Lord and Savior, from the from God in the flesh who can change our life, that he's not only a God who can be in heaven, but he's also a God who can love us through some of the most difficult times of our life. I'm so thankful today that we are not going through this service without our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but that he is here with us. And over the last couple of days, it has not been easy, but you know what I felt? I felt that love of Jesus to know that this was his friend. And that he only, he knew that he had, even though that this sickness was not unto death for eternity, but he wanted to walk through with this family through those difficult days. Later on, Jesus gets to the house of Mary and Martha. And when it says that when Mary was coming to Jesus, he saw him and she fell down at his feet and she said unto him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus therefore saw her weeping and Jews also weeping, which came with her. The Bible says he groaned in his spirit and he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. And at that point, the Bible tells us that Jesus wept. Then he said, behold, how he loved him. The reason that this passage is so important for us today is because in this moment we see the human side of Jesus and the divine side of Jesus come together. The word troubled. You know, there's a lot of troubling things that we go through in this life. And the Bible makes it clear that there are troubles that we will face in this world. In the book of 2 Thessalonians, the Bible says that we would not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled. It means that sometimes we go through frightening times while we live here on earth. Another passage tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says we are troubled on every side, meaning that life sometimes put pressures on us and it wants to trouble our soul. And in Luke chapter 1 and verse 29, it says, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She was perplexed. She was disturbed. But what I love about John's gospel in chapter 11 is for the first time we see trouble used in an unusual way. It means that Jesus was troubled, he was stirred up, he was agitated. But it was not a trouble that he could not answer. And what makes this passage so important for us today as we celebrate Brother Allen's life is that he was He said to all of us today who has made Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, he says, I have the answer for your troubles. And today Jesus is the answer for the trouble that we feel. Jesus loved Brother Allen. Jesus was a friend to Brother Allen. But most of all, he was a savior to Brother Allen. And today, just like what he told Mary and Martha when they were so troubled in their spirit, he told them, I am the resurrection and the life. Whosoever shall believe upon me shall never die, but shall live in eternity with me forever. I'm glad to know today that there's not a trouble I can ever face in this world that Jesus doesn't have the answer for. And right now, our hearts are troubled. But I'm glad to know that Jesus has been the answer through all of this. You know, when we see people going through times like this, we understand that without Jesus, we cannot make it. And I look back over these 43 years and just how God put this whole plan together but he also knew this day was coming. And he also knew that he had answered the trouble that we would go through. When Brother Allen had confessed him and believed upon his heart that Jesus was Lord, he knew that when this day would If you can. But if you die first, I'm going to get the kids to do it. So I'm going to try my best to make my husband proud. Um, and even if, if I mess up and, and I don't make him proud, he would tell me I did. He always said, you always make me proud. I'm always proud of you. 
when I think about us and our story, I, it, it just came to me this morning that um, it's kind of like that Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way. We did it our way. I can promise you there's not another family anywhere that did it like we did it. Um, extraordinary, extraordinary, I think, describes us and our relationship and our lives together. We did it our way. So, um, he was born September the 10th, died March the 22nd, not the same year. <laughs> <laughs> he was taken to Savannah by helicopter Wednesday night. Many of you have said what was wrong, I didn't know, and we really didn't know. In September, he started having some issues for the first time ever. He was 79 years old, and that was the first time he ever had been in the hospital for an illness. He had had two surgeries on his heel and, and ankle, but he had never been in the hospital because of an illness. Started, and we really didn't know, and we still don't know exactly what was going on, but I think now he was starting to have some of the little fatigue strokes, and they were getting worse and worse. But he died uh, last, on March the 22nd, surrounded by 22 of us in that hospital. Savannah Memorial didn't know what had hit them when we all came in. But they were so gracious, and they let us each one go in. And, and we went in two and three at the time, and we were, every one of us was able to say our goodbyes, just telling how much we loved him, and that we were okay, and that he could go. Um, it was beautiful, but it was the hardest thing ever. We loved on him, and we watched, literally we watched, as the Spirit left his body. And it was such a peaceful, calm, beautiful, beautiful sight to know that God just took him. Just took him. So who was out? I'm doing some of this for the grandchildren. Oh, and by the way, if you are a child of our relationship, um, Jason, Carrie, Wendy, Holly, Amy, Jay, stand up. These are our beautiful children. And y'all can sit down. If you are a grandchild of Judy or Alan, stand up. Now these are the most beautiful. Okay, you can sit down. Alan graduated from Nichols High School. And I thought you kids would enjoy this. I, I did this this morning on about two hours sleep. So this is helping me not to be so nervous while I'm up here. His diploma. You guys would be happy to know he was in the Future Farmers of America. <laughs> and he was in the National Bayer Club. <laughs> Good thing to know. 24 people in his graduating class. 24. So he did great. Um, after he graduated from Nichols, he worked a couple of odd jobs and then he joined the National Guard. He had basic training in Kentucky and that's where he met and formed uh, later married Patricia Manley Vickers, his wife of 13 years. During their marriage, they had Jason and Carrie and like I said, they worked with the telephone company and then he farmed after hours, literally, from five or six o'clock until dark. And then he would go in and take a shower, get dressed, and come to see me. Um, uh, we really fell in love sitting on the sofa after 11 or 12 o'clock at night, so tired we could hardly hold our heads up, but somehow that young love just kicked in and we met. Like I said, we did it our way. So one Friday afternoon after the girl's dad had picked them up for the weekend visitation, I had a wreck and I told my car. Somehow Alan found out, I still don't know how I found out I had the wreck, 
he came to the house, and that night he asked me to marry him. I had known the man maybe four weeks at the most. We had one date, one real date, where he picked me up, and we went somewhere together and came back. Only one date. But he asked me to marry him. Did he have the ring and he on his knee? You know, you see all these beautiful proposals now, and they just go on out. No. He walked in after I had my wreck, and he said, Honey, you need to take care of yourself because we're going to get married. <laughs> we're going to get married. Um, and I tease him all the time about the romantic proposal. And every time I would remind him, or I'd see somebody with all these romantic things going on, I reminded him, you didn't do that. And he said, well, what I did worked. <laughs> so that's the way he did. Um, six weeks, six weeks after we met, we got married. On June 27, 1980. And just like that, at the ages of 26 and 36, we became a family of seven. Alan, Jason, six kids, and has another child. We did. That's just the way we did it. There were so many extraordinary experiences in our life. I'm just going to share two or three with you. Um, I was 26 when we got married. So two years later, Jay was born. So I must have been about 28. We went on vacation, and we went to a stop by a Stubbies. Well, Alan and Jason could just get out and go in and do their thing and be through. But I had to take Wendy, Holly, Amy, and Carrie in the bathroom with me. And they had done their thing, and I said, stand right here. Do not leave out of this bathroom until I can go in. So I'm in a stall, and all of these little girls are standing out there, and they are three, four, five, and six. And this lady comes in and said, Oh, you girls are so cute. How old are y'all? Three, four, five, and six. I can just see that woman. <laughs> are y'all all sisters? Yes, ma'am, and mom was pregnant. <laughs> and needless to say, I stayed in my stall. <laughs> the second story that the kids love, um, the kids were involved in everything, and we, we were involved in whatever they were involved in. So at one of the Coffee High football games, one of the girls was a cheerleader and had thrown out those little balls, and somehow Jay wound up with one. After the game, Jay and Katie were out on the um, football field playing, and as we got ready to go, Jay came to us and Katie, and Jay, somebody had slapped him. He was about David's age, about six, seven. Somebody had slapped him, and left the print on his face and had taken his little football. Well, that was not the thing to do. We <laughs> rode that stadium looking, there was a group of five or six little boy, bigger boys, and almost everybody had left, and I thought we were not going to find them. And I kind of wish we hadn't. <laughs> but, um, we finally, we were pulling and, and Katie saw them. She said, there they are, Uncle Alan, that's them. We were in a Ford Bronco and he threw that thing in park so fast that we're still shaking. He gets out, grabs this young man that's probably in his teens, he's a teenager, picks him up. <laughs> he would go to jail today. <laughs> then he picks him up and as he speaks, Every word he pins that boy into the Bronco and he says, If you ever touch my boy again, I will squash you like a bug. <laughs> and while he was there, Jay 
had them to fly his flag over the state capitol. And he brought this and, and surprised Emma with it for one of his birthdays, and it reads, the flag of the United States of America. This is to certify that the accompanying flag was flown over the United States Capitol on September the 10th, 2000, at the request of the Honorable Saxby Chambliss, Member of Congress. The flag was flown for Alan Vickers on the occasion of his birthday. Well, that's sweet. So during the years that the kids were growing up, we tried to stay involved in everything they did. We watched the girls cheer, we watched them on the dance line, we watched them in the marching band, marched them on the, watch, them on the homecoming courts, graduated from high school, Jay reading his valedictorian speech, and all the other fun things that parents get to be part of. And one by one, these kids started growing up and bringing home dates. Uh, Jim was the first one, and when we realized he was never going to leave, <laughs> when the others started coming, um, Alan started meeting them at the door with a shotgun. <laughs> Didn't he, Brian? Did. <laughs> Through those years, we learned that our lives truly are vapor. We're here today, and very quickly can be gone tomorrow. So much too soon, the kids were graduating from college, getting real jobs, let me say that again. The kids were graduating from college and getting real jobs, some of them much quicker than the others. <laughs> but soon, they were developing their own lives, getting married, having children, and those wonderful grandbabies started being born. And just like we've done with the kids, pretty soon we were involved in everything the grandkids were involved in, whether they wanted us to be or not. We went to their ball games. We went everywhere they went. Uh, Brother Bob and Brother Heath have already said that we went as a group. Wherever we went, we went as a group. So my husband was such a good man. He was so good to me. I knew he loved me, and he would do anything for me. He would do anything he could to make me happy. He supported me in everything I did. He protected me from all the hurt he could. He was my biggest supporter and my biggest cheerleader. And I have told him so many times, so I don't have that regret that I have not already told him. He truly was the wind beneath my wings. He was my support. He was my companion. He was everything. But... When I knew I had reached my limit and I better back off, I did. And when I saw the eyebrows start coming up to an arch, I, I'm like, okay, you got to back off. And I knew it. I want to um, share something. I was going through some things this last couple of days. <laughs> Most of you know that I love to decorate and we built three houses and we moved more times than we could count. And instead of playing musical chairs, we played musical houses. Literally. But he was always such a trooper and helped me move the furniture wherever I wanted it, a couple inches here, there. He'd hang everything and, and do all that. Well, the first night, he was in the hospital in September. It was late. And he was re saying something. And I went close to him to try to figure out what he was saying. And I heard him say, here to serve, here to heal, and here to save. And I realized he's laying in the bed and he's reading the, the hospital motto that's on the, on the board over here across the room from him. And it's, it's like a little plaque and it said, you know, here to save, here to uh, heal, and here to serve. And he looked at me and he said, now remember, we have moved more times than we can. He's hung everything for me. He said, you really want me to hang that in every room? <laughs> in the hospital bed. He was one of the hardest working men and one of the greatest providers I know. He worked for General Telephone, all Taylor Winstream for over 30 years. And then when he retired, he continued to work as a contractor for six more years. We used to ask each other, what will we do when we retire? 
won't have anything to do with these civil war. But like everyone else, that won't be the case. And when we finally retired, we enjoyed almost 12 years together of retirement. And we have loved every minute of it. We, what do we do with most of that time? Whatever the kids are doing, we follow them. Again, whether they invited us or not. <laughs> and if they invited us, we were sure to go. But together, Alan and I have done it our way, our marriage. We experienced the good and the very good and the bad and the very bad, the mundane and the extraordinary. We had a wonderful life of 43 years together. When God gave me Alan Vickers, he put him in my life. That was the best thing that has ever happened to me. Words cannot begin to describe the pain and hurt that all of us are feeling right now. I mean, I never dreamed that it would hurt like it hurts. But all the kids and I thank you so much for everything you have done for us these past few days. We've been showered with so much love. Thank you for the food, the visits, the texts, the prayers, the phone calls. Everything you've done is so appreciated. And it has helped to make these last four days so much more bearable. When he died, we were David just got up on top of him and hugged him and, and laid there with him and I was beside him in the bed with him holding him and little Julie came up and she said um, Mimi I want to sit my papa and I said Julie I am not giving up my position right now <laughs> and I stayed right there but it was such a sweet precious precious time with him to say our goodbyes so in closing we've had many tears and many sorrows as that song says we've had questions for tomorrow but through it all through it all we've learned to trust in jesus to depend upon his word he has been so good and so faithful to us and our family and I know that as Alan has already bowed his knees and cried, holy glory, I can't imagine what he experienced. Last Sunday, he was with us in church. He was able to go to church with me. And through some of the praise and worship of Chad, Alan was over. He was not one to quickly raise his hands in praise, but he did last Sunday, not knowing that within three or four days, he would really be in the presence of the Lord and able to praise. It was beautiful. So, to my husband, until I see you again, Alan, I love you so much and I thank you for loving me, for protecting me and making my life complete. It wasn't the things we accomplished or the things we did, but it was having you to share them with that meant so much to me. I'll always love you, Al.